This is this the home I stayed in right here. With all the shit in the yard. <laughs> were these lots always empty? No, definitely like not. Uh, there were actually three buildings here. Mm -hmm. Over here, but two more buildings. These are actually two of the first drug buildings to come down. What do you mean drug building? Both selling and using, raided by the police multiple times. A lot of bullshit goes on inside of there. Bodies found, murders going on, shit like that. So after a while, they come and tear them down. And it's the, it's the same thing. I can go five, six, seven, eight houses on this block, each lot, and show you the same shit. Jermel Chavis grew up here in the west side of Chicago. And he's a veteran of, well, two wars. He served four years in Iraq and then survived the war on drugs. Being in Iraq, we didn't know what we were fighting for. We just knew we were fighting for something. Coming back home to the hood, like, that was a fucked up transition for me. Because now, here it is, I'm leaving Iraq, the war, you know what I mean? And then I'm coming home to Chirac. My chances of survival in that war were greater than it is in making it out of these neighborhoods, bro. And this is what the war on drugs created, these conditions. What's it like living through that trauma? I mean, shit. There's a reason for them sleepless nights, you know what I mean? But you got kids of your own, you got to fight through that shit, you know what I mean? Chavis is hoping access to the cannabis industry will help rebuild his old neighborhood. He applied for a license to own a cannabis dispensary last year, when Illinois legalized it with a social equity plan attached, which would give folks from communities targeted by the war on drugs a better shot of actually benefiting from the new industry. Right now, there are zero majority Black-owned dispensaries in Illinois. You're talking about a million-dollar industry, and you're talking about an industry that was built and pioneered on our backs. Like, I played a part in it, like, you know what I mean? I sold cannabis. We're sitting in jail right now because of it. We're in the graveyard right now because of it. We made this industry. This isn't, this isn't something new. The plan used a points system. Applicants were scored on categories like their veteran status, community engagement ideas, and business plans. But the state got way more applications than expected. So regulators decided the only applications that would be considered for a license would be those with perfect scores. And that's when things got complicated. So what was your score? Oh, my score was a 249. Is 249 good? Yeah, it's the, the perfect score is 250. Ah, so you're one point off. Yeah, one point shy. Only 21 applicants were left standing. They'd vie for 75 dispensary licenses through a lottery system, meaning multiple pot shops for guys like this, and none for guys like Jermel, who lost a point for his hypothetical floor plan, or the other near-perfect applicants. I already have my location picked out. It's perfect. I know the neighborhood. I know the people. I know the troublemakers, you know, I, and, I, and they know me. Yeah. Former state senator Ricky Hendon is a mainstay of West Chicago life and applied for a dispensary license. He was left out of the lottery and left wondering about the loopholes in the equity program. They have a clause that says if you promise to hire six minorities, you qualify as a social equity applicant. That's all you need. You have to promise to hire six people who are black, who are... Or Latino, uh -huh. you qualify as a social equity uh, applicant. Just hire them. Just hire them. And so these are all social equity applicants. Supposedly. Is there a danger that social equity programs are over-promising? The process itself is so onerous. Going against big money is such a tough thing. If Governor J.B. Pritzker gets this wrong, he will not be reelected. There's a different kind of activism out here now. We ain't taking that shit no more. This whole industry has made billion, a billion dollars, and we've received nothing. Ricky, Jermel, and plenty of other pissed off would-be dispensary owners lobbied for a legislative fix. No equity. No equity. No diversity. No diversity. No diversity. No diversity. Means no peace. No peace. All right, we're gonna start, everybody. These people here, they're still waiting on their perfect scores or their almost perfect scores That's so right. that yes. they could be in the lottery yes. to have a chance to be in this emerging market. That's right. And State Representative LaShawn Ford helped pass a new bill that'll set up two additional lotteries for licenses, one for applicants with near-perfect scores and another specifically for people from over-policed areas or otherwise victims of the war on drugs. 
they want to open up businesses not just so that they could have a dispensary to sell marijuana, but they want to grow their communities. They want That's to help right. their communities That's grow. Right. They want to make they sure right they're checks. able to write checks in order to make the communities better. They want to hire people. What we're trying to do here is dismantle 90 years mm -hmm. of drug policy that created a situation mm -hmm. where we were locked out and locked up for decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And undoing that will take a lot. And it will it'll not end now. This is a continuing fight. It's an ongoing fight that's now delayed the awarding of licenses for more than a year. A year when Illinois' existing white-owned weed dispensaries raked in more than $600 million and a year when the economic problems of places like West Chicago have only gotten worse. Take me through the challenges of the first rollout, because it wasn't perfect. No, and what is? This, your office is accountable for this rollout. Right, which is why we gotta work really, really hard <laughs> right. and, br and bring in all these voices so part as of we me, make changes. Part of me wants to be like, this is an accountability conversation where it didn't work out the first year. And, yeah, and I firmly disagree with that. Okay. It's delayed, but it's not done yet. And the fixes that we've been able to do almost in real time, which is another thing that is not normal for government. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to solve for racism and capitalism and structures that have been existed for 100 years. That's what we're working with. Mm -hmm. And dismantling that is going to take a lot. Are you biting off more than you can chew here? Maybe. Like, can government really do this? Like I don't know. Can we? I know, I know government won't do it if you don't try. Right. I know we've never had it because no one tried. And I know if we give up, we'll never have it. So the question for me is not can government really do this, is should government try to do this? Why wouldn't we try? We, we now have the tools and the language to talk about this in a way that nobody was talking about 15 years ago. The new lotteries have yet to be scheduled. So social equity applicants are still just waiting for their shot. But for guys like Jermel, leaving his future up to the luck of the draw still feels kind of unfair. The state legislature has now passed a new bill for new lotteries. Exactly. What does that feel like? Bittersweet, because um, it's not a victory. I mean, it's a vi we, we can take it as a victory, but it's, it's not a victory. It's just essentially you guys are, are following your own rules of what you were supposed to do in the first place. It's not guaranteeing me that I'll, I'll have that license. I still have to go into a lottery. Uh, one application against 4,000. Well, because there's no guarantees in anything, right? Yeah. But what you're asking for is a shot. Yeah, a just a shot. shot. Just a fair shot. 